Welcome to topic two in portfolio management on the topic of risk and return. As a portfolio manager, it is important to note that your objective is always the same. That objective is to maximize the utility of the investor. Therefore, a key question in portfolio management is how do investors derive their utility? Well, when we look at utility theory, we start with the notion that we know that people invest in order to defer consumption into the future. Therefore, if they're deferring consumption, they're going to want to know that the value of their wealth at the point in time where they can consume in the future is greater than today. That is, they want a positive return for deferring their consumption. Hence, investors gain utility out of earning a positive expected return. Theory also tells us that investors are risk averse. That is, we're only willing to take on additional units of risk if we're rewarded with higher expected returns for doing so. Because people tend to be risk averse as a whole, utility functions also incorporate a negative premium for risk. That is, investor utility is higher for assets that have lower levels of risk. So risk and expected return are very important parts of the utility function, and all utility models at their core have that utility is a function of positive expected returns and negative risk. However, the question becomes how do we actually define risk and return in financial markets? So the most basic yet mostly used utility function is the idea of mean variance utility. The mean variance utility function assumes that utility is entirely determined by two variables, the expected return and the risk as measured by the variance of those expected returns. Hence, under this particular utility uh, theory, we can define risk as the statistical concept of variance. And variance just means deviations from the mean. It is because this idea of mean variance utility that we have many models in finance that, that use variance or standard deviation, which is simply just the square root of variance, as a measure of risk. However, it's important to note that these are simply statistical concepts and not financial theories. And when we think about the statistical concepts, we actually understand that there's a problem when we measure risk using variance. That is, because variance just measures deviations from the mean, it treats upside deviations and downside deviations the same. Therefore, if you've got an asset where there's a small chance of a very large positive return, like a lottery ticket, then if you're using variance as a measure of risk, you're going to identify that huge upside risk, that, that variance because of that, that, that potential for the huge upside event, you're going to measure that as being negative toward investors' utility. Whereas clearly people gain positive utility out of upside variance. Equally, a investor who adopts a, a mean variance utility function will treat extreme downside events as having the same effect on utility as extreme upside events. Therefore, when we think about risk in particular, we need to perhaps move beyond the concept of simply looking at variance and think of other alternative measures of risk. And that is where alternative theories of utility come into play. So when we're examining our utility theories, the, the question is how can we actually go about measuring the risk and return of an asset? And return in particular, because the key issue of return that we're interested in uh, as a portfolio manager is the expected future return of an asset. We're investing today, we're concerned with what we expect the return to be tomorrow and into the future. So one way we can possibly try to measure expected future returns could be looking at the past using historic returns as an estimate of the future. The problem is that evidence shows us that returns vary significantly across time. Therefore, if you simply just extrapolate for the past, uh, you will not get a necessarily accurate measure of expected returns. Instead, what we tend to use is we tend to use models of expected returns, and these are known as asset pricing models. The most well-known asset pricing model is the capital asset pricing model. It measures expected returns as a function of one risk factor, which is beta. Beta being the systematic risk, or the co-movement between the stock's returns and the broader market's returns. Similar issues apply when we're looking at uh, history as a measure of risk. Although unlike returns which tend to vary across time, risk does tend to be more constant across time. So the structures of variances and covariance matrices 
do tend to be more constant. So we potentially can use historic risk to measure future risk. And we don't tend to have equivalent models of expected future risk like we have asset pricing models for returns. So once we've considered the measurement of risk and return in financial markets, uh, we now need to think of whether there may be other ways that we can consider, particularly the concept of risk, that accounts for some of the problems with variance, uh, particularly this issue that it's treating upside and downside risk peaking. Therefore, many additional models of investor utility actually say that you need to consider more than just the first two moments of the return distribution. So more than just the mean and the variance of returns. But you have to consider uh, additional statistical concepts, which are the higher moments of the return distribution. And these include the skewness and kurtosis of that return distribution. So skewness is the idea is if we have a distribution of expected returns. And you can think about that as on one axis, we've got all the possible expected return outcomes. And on the vertical axis, we've got the probability of each of those outcomes occurring. In a mean variance world, we actually assume that the return distribution follows a normal distribution, or it follows a bell curve. In that case, it's perfectly symmetrical. The idea of skewness is where we have an asymmetry in the return distribution. So we might have a longer negative tail, in which case we would have a negatively skewed return distribution, or we might have a longer positive tail, in which case we've got a positively skewed return distribution. Ketosis is the idea that extreme events are more probable than what is expected by a normal distribution. So if you have a distribution of returns with positive ketosis, that actually means the tails, the extreme events, are fatter or probabilities higher than what would be assumed under a normal distribution. Now, investors don't like uh, positive ketosis. They don't like the risk that extreme events are more likely. And in particular, they don't like negative skewness. And if we start to consider negative skewness in our utility functions, we can see that we can start to get some way toward addressing this issue between treating upside and downside risk equally. Because while investors seek higher expected returns for higher variance uh, of uh, returns, so the risk return trade-off that we've learnt about in a lot of earlier finance courses, perhaps an additional relationship with expected returns relates to skewness. That is, investors like positively skewed assets. Okay, they like lottery ticket payoffs. And investors do not like negatively skewed assets. They do not like uh, return distributions that have small probabilities of very large negative outcomes. So in order to invest in an asset that has a negatively skewed return distribution, an investor is going to expect higher returns for doing so. So potentially the risk return trade-off is actually three-dimensional. We've got expected returns as a function of both variance and skewness. Higher variance, higher expected returns. More negative skewness, higher expected returns. And this is the notion that prospect theory brings in, because prospect theory says that uh, investors will assess their investment uh, based on a reference point, and their utility function will differ on both the positive and, and negative sides of that utility function, or they will treat upside and downside risk differently to each other. So we do have to be quite critical in the way that we consider our estimation of risk in financial markets. Now, our discussion thus far about risk and expected returns has related to what we call a one-period model, in that we're looking at one period ahead, what is the expected return and the distribution of a range of possible return outcomes and the probabilities of those outcomes occurring. However, investors don't tend to think and invest in a one-period world. They tend to invest uh, over multiple periods, and particularly if we think about long-term horizons. And when we look at the long-term horizon, a long-term investment is just a combination of sequential one-period estimations. So we might, for example, have for a particular month a return distribution, an, an expected return distribution that will have a mean, an expected return, and a variance, a range of possible outcomes. We then invest for the next month, and if markets are relatively efficient, the, the next month's return should be independent from the current month. So again, from that distribution, we've got our expected return variance, and so on. So that, that uh, expected return is generated month on month for the period of a long-term investment. Now, what's interesting is when we move from our one-period model through to a multi-period model, is the effect this actually has on risk and return. Because over multiple periods, 
Where you have an asset that generates a positive expected return, take for example equities compared to a risk free rate, the risk of, let's say the equities asset class, that, that asset class with a higher expected returns actually underperforming something like a risk free rate is quite high when we just look at a one period model because there's quite a large variance of returns. However, as we repeat that experiment over and over again, or as we move to our multi-period model, over a long time period, the risk of equities underperforming the risk-free rate becomes significantly lower. Therefore, we know that in long-term investments, uh, risk and return is actually different to, to our one-period world. So that brings to the end our discussion on topic two, risk and return revisited. Thank you for listening.